Hello everyone, it's Yintan here, and today we are sitting down with our resident fountain of knowledge with regards to the Eve lore, and that's Asherothi. But rather than talking about a developing subject, today what I hope to do is give you guys a bit more of an introduction into some of the main factions in EVE Online, how they came to be, and what ideologies they really represent, as well as some of the tension inside those factions themselves. Yes, greetings fellow Empyreans, I am Ashtarathi, and today I believe that we are going to be looking at the Galente Federation. My, uh, probably one of the ones I've spent the most time serving, even though I was born Amar, I spent some time in Galente Faction Warfare. And they have a pretty, particularly interesting uh, history and, um, I guess, existence, because to me, the Galente are, once you get below the surface and start to understand what they are, they almost are the exact opposite of what you think of when you first hear about them. Yeah, I always remember the, uh, the line that they used to have in the intro for them, which is the Galente Federation, the one true democracy in EVE Online, or in New Eden, I think was the, the correct yeah. phrase. Yeah, yes, yes. So on the surface, you have uh, the Galente is all about democracy and freedom and and choice and surgically enhanced cat people and whatever people want right like that is what you think of when you think of the glente federation whereas like when you think of like the uh, the caldari state for example you think of more uh oppressive order and control and structure and all that kind of stuff but when you go below the surface like i said uh you find a little bit uh more it's a it's a little bit more complex than you would expect so I think that we should probably start towards the beginning of the Galente people. Uh, the first thing to know is that Galente and Kaldari, Galente Prime and Kaldari Prime, their home planets are actually in the same solar system. They're, they're both part of the Luminaire system, which means they're adjacent to each other, which is why the Galente ran into the Kaldari so early in their development. So this was happening at about the same time that the Amar were running into the Mimitar and enslaving them. Uh, about that same time, the Galente takes to the stars, and they run into uh, another planet uh, known as Kaldari. And this planet had recently, uh, as in the last thousand years, had undergone basically collapse of their empire and saw the rise of these corporations that were starting to take care of their people for them, the mega corporations. So the very, the, the, the very early form formations of, of what would later be known as the Kaldari state. Um, and the Glente saw these people and was like, okay, well, we have spacefaring technology. We have all this cool stuff. Uh, we will share this technology for you with you if you join our new cool federation. <clears throat> so unlike the Amar who enslaved, these guys like tried to make deals with it. It's like, hey, we're going to bring you up to being a starfaring species, but you have to uh, join the Glente federation. And so the Kaldari did along with the Jinmei and the Matari. No, not the Matari. Manar, the Manar people, that's right, not Matari, Manar. I always get those two confused, very similar. Um, also, they don't really jump out in the story past the fact that they exist. Um, so you've got the Kaldari, who's this corporate kind of uh, planet. You've got the Yinmei, which is this very deeply almost Buddhist style, religious, pacifist uh, civilization. And then you have the Glente, which is all about uh, order and... Um, democracy and red tape and bureaucracy uh and eventually the state started to like one of the mega corporations started to expand out in space to a different solar system and when the federation found out they were like hey you're not allowed to take on new space without going to the senate first for approval and the kaldari responded with but this isn't us operating as a state we're not doing this as as a government we're doing this as an individual corporation and the corporations can do what they want, they don't fall under the jurisdiction of the Senate. And so uh, this disagreement was, was uh, swiftly taken care of by Galente uh, blockading and then orbitally bombarding Kaldari Prime from space. So uh, this moment was, is, is the foundation of all of the hatred between uh, the Galente and the Kaldari. Uh, there is <clears throat> lots of stories within the state of heroes that have uh, that from this time period 
when the state was fleeing from Galente, quote unquote, oppression. Uh, and then they, they, so they fled to what's now New Caldari and established their home there. Um, needless to say, they both, they, neither of them have gotten along very well since. The state, even though they originally had to be helped along by the Federation, by this point, because of their corporate um, powerhouse, their, their research and development was significantly better than basically anybody else. So by this point, their, their technology had even outstripped the Federation. And so they really saw themselves as being independent. And so thus the Caldari Galente War begins. I want to just take, can we just wheel back a little bit here? Sure. Because we're already, we're already looking at the Galante Federation as existing and, and being this big spacefaring civilization. But how did the Galante Federation itself come to be before it came in contact with the Caldari? And can you give us a little bit of an idea of how it's structured? I mean, the Federation was largely started because of the contact between the Caldari and the Galante. Um, prior to that, in 22463, uh, which I'm not sure exactly what that corresponds to in YC years, um, but this is obviously pre-YC1, the Glente first identified the Caldari entering their industrial age. And so the Caldari were entering, were in their industrial age and the Glente were coming into their spacefaring age. And then they formed what was known as the Dipl a Diplomatic Union of Independent States, which was the Federated Union of Galente Prime, more commonly known as the Galente Federation, which was founded in 23-121. It consisted of the Galente, the Antaki, the Matari, and the Caldari. I'd have to look up any information about like what the uh, Federation was like prior to like taking off from the planet. I believe that they were originally a French colony. There is actually a really good timeline. Let me look it up real quick. Basically, the Galente Federation was people from the Tau Ceti system uh, and were uh, a French colony originally. And then when the Eve Gate collapsed, the smaller settlements uh, were destroyed. But then the Rovener Empire, like the emperor of, of this empire, uh, continues onward through, their, uh, through the succession. So Rovener III starts a new calendar, which is the uh, age of Rovenar. So Rovenar is a huge um, entity in the early Galente days. But then uh, the empire collapses, they spot Kaldari on Kaldari Prime, and um, thus like the Federation begins. So ba both, of their both of their civilizations, the Kaldari and the Galente, both had just recently seen, relatively recently seen, a collapse of a unifying empire. And now what you have is the remains. So in the case of the Galante Federation, you had uh, a bunch of their tech and de civilization development that they got from this uh, long living empire. Whereas with the state, uh, they hadn't actually gotten to that point. And so when they collapsed, uh, the, you see the mega corporations just kind of stepping in to take on day-to-day -day life. Okay, so so we end up with the, the first Galante Caldari War, and what is the and that kind of springboards both the Caldari state and the Galante Federation effectively into existence. And what is the aftermath of that first war? Where does that situate both of them? So they actually start their war before their contact with the Amarians, which I think is fairly key. So they. Um, they're struggling against this, and uh, you know, their 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 frenemy, their whatever you want to call it, the uh, the Caldari state, and they. Oh, oh, hold on. Let me let me actually double check this to make sure I got it correct. So, <clears throat> yeah. So the first thing is is that the actions of the Galente were extraordinarily controversial. Um, even the Intaki, uh, who again were relatively pacifists, were super unhappy. With what the Caldari were doing. So while the, or sorry, what, what the Galente were doing. So while the Caldari um, were kind of punished by for trying to like force themselves into independence, uh, there was a chunk of the Intaki that basically went through the process of independence themselves and said, you know, this is not okay. We're we're not going to be part of this anymore. And so now that you have the Intaki Syndicate, right? Those are the people who rejected the warmongering ways of the early Galente Federation. 
Um, and this kind of led to various conflicts uh, and, and schisms within the Federation uh, as the ultra-nationalists are really pushing this engine of war. Uh, eventually, the, there was Tova, uh, Tovil Toba, who is a Kaldari Navy like hero. And he went into Galente Prime's orbit and fought there and pointed his ship down at one of the cities on Galente Prime and crashed his, I believe it was carrier, um, onto the planet of Galente Prime, which killed two million people and uh, instantly, and then like millions more after that. And it was kind of like the moment that freed Kaldari away. Like, so they were, they were trying to stop the Kaldari from fleeing. There was a conflict between the two planets. And then uh, this guy, this military leader, uh, did that move, which basically bought the time for the Kaldari to get away, and thus somewhat ended the first Kaldari Galente war. Um, as now they they now have contact with the Amar and the Mimitar, and they have way bigger problems than just an uppity member state. All right. Well. The thing, the thing about ever naming a war the first is that you know that that generally means that there's going to be uh, the second. So Correct. what happens to lead up to the second Caldari Galante War? And this is why I was a little bit less, or I was a little bit shaky as to like what ended the first war, exactly what point it was, because kind of all of this blends into each other. Because it was more like, instead of, in a lot of ways it wasn't two wars, it was more like one war with a failed period of peace. Um, and there are terrorists on both sides of the Galente and the Caldari that are hyper-nationalistic, who are willing to do whatever it takes to disrupt any kind of peace. And so very quickly, things kind of descend back into, um, into war between the Caldari and the Galente. And it's about this point where the Galente actually get the upper hand and it's when the Jovian first show up, really, in a, in a public way, to give the Kaldari the hydrostatic capsule. Which is the precursor to the technology that all of us players use in the game. Correct. The original purpose of the hydrostatic capsule was just an interface with your ship. Um, it wasn't until uh, the Empires got a hold of it that they realized that this also solved another one of their problems, which is that their cloning technology basically fries the brain in order to do the clone. And so then the question is, when do you do this, right? Because like you want to do it as soon as or as close to death as as possible, but at the same time, it's like, can you really predict the second that someone's going to die at any given time? And so cloning has always struggled up until this point. But with the pod being the thing that you are in to pilot the ship, now they know, hey, if the pod is breached, that means the person's going to die. And so they tied those two things together. So when your pod gets breached, that's when it does the uh, transneural brain scan and uh, off you go to your next clone. Okay, so what advantage did that really offer the Kaldari in the war then? Well, so the Glente have always been really big on automation. Uh, robots, uh, drones, etc., and so they just had more force than the state did. And with the introduction of the hydrostatic cop capsule as just a piloting device, this allowed their fewer members to be more um, effective with less crew and uh, more uh, and uh, just better piloting. As as you can tell by us being pod pilots. We are better at using our ships in general than your average um, pirate that is piloting it without a capsule. Having to shout orders and using like manual motions like a Neanderthal. <laughs> Get me gunnery! So this, this conflict kind of goes forward with uh, various stalemates uh, for a long time. And then the... Jove, um, and it, first of all, let me point out that the Jove didn't just help the Kaldari, right? The Jove also were really focused on helping the Mimitar, 
And so they actually worked with the Galente a little bit to, to help out the Mimitar as well. So they were kind of working with everybody a little bit to just try to help the people that were being oppressed effectively. Although the Jove does seem to have a very uh, particular affection for the Mimitar people, but that's a story for another day, I think. Um, any rate, so this whole thing kind of continued to build towards a head. The Amar and the Mimitar have their conflict. The Galente are now helping the Mimitar free themselves from the Amar. They're still having problems with the Kaldari. Everybody's fighting, and that's when uh, basically the Jove help negotiate the Ulai Convention, which is when uh, we now see the formation of Concord and theoretically peace. And that was, you know, 119 years ago. And so I guess at that point, is that where the Galante Federation really solidifies? Because you talked about it, you know, basically coming to be in response to the Caldari state, but being very different in that early period. Um, what has it become by this point? Well, um, in a lot of ways, the Federation was still kind of basically a standard democratic um, senatorial uh, organization, uh, government. They still have uh, the Yinme, they still have most of the Intaki, they still have the Minari. Um, so most of the Federation is still intact. They just have this one upstart. Um, the Glente Federation, though, really started to change with the removal of Soro for Otran. Um, this kind of represented a very dramatic shift in uh, Galente positioning. So Sorio Foratron was uh, the president of the Galente Federation. He, he hailed from the Intaki, and um, he was like, he was very popular. This was back in YC 111. So this is actually within our time. So this is 80 years, eight years ago or so. So he was attempting to take a second term as president. He was changing the laws to allow him to be able to continue to be president. And at the same time, Mentis Black, who is the head of the Black Eagles, which is basically the Galente's uh, Federation Intelligence Office, uh, like Black Site kind of organization. They're the spies. They're the CIA, the NSA, all of those three letter acronyms all all rolled into one is uh, these these black eagles, and so it's led by a guy named Mantis Black, who ultimately didn't like Soro Fortran, and so uh, more or less orchestrated his downfall um, into political disgrace. And then when Fortran uh stepped down, the, then then uh, Jacques Rodin, Jacques Rodin was effectively installed as president. Uh, Rodin is a very interesting character. He is a capsuleer. He is um, kind of a scary individual. He's got glowing green eyes. He makes no attempt to uh, not be spooky. Like he, he, want, he intentionally wants to intimidate his, the people he talks to. He was the leader of uh, Rodin Shipyard, which is the largest, um, ship manufacturing company within the federation and uh he divested from it when he became president but uh in a lot of ways like that's a very questionable relationship for example when uh the nurgle was being produced the uh, tech 2 triglavian ship while most of the other empires gave it to their navy for development um and the mamatar went with thucker because the thucker are the people that have the most exposure to this sort of tech uh, the Glente actually gave the contract to Rodin's shipyard. If you go look at um, the Nurgle, you'll see that it's made by Rodin. So it's like he's not actually part of Rodin's shipyard anymore, but he definitely favors them. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of the Glente Federation that kind of reflects like the worst fever dreams of what you might be imagining is happening in American politics right now. <laughs> like if you take the worst version of what you think of, that's basically what's happening within the Glente Federation. So you have this secret shadow government that is effectively co uh, controlling everything and is trying to spy on everyone and keeps getting caught. And um, this incredibly militarized organization um, and nation that is effectively masquerading as a bastion of freedom 
uh, and allowing their people to basically do whatever they want as a way of kind of distracting them long enough so that way they can continue to uh, amass power. Okay, wow. Right. <laughs> Give me a moment. i got to figure out how to like ask a question that moves off from that. Well, that's what I mean by the, the Galente, when you go below the surface, ends up being basically the exact opposite of what you would expect. Like when I first heard about the Caldari Galente War, you immediately think that the Caldari were probably the pricks that, that got in trouble. But then you realize that it's actually the Galente that orbitally bombarded their own, effectively their own people, just because of a political disagreement, which is not that great. And then, um, you know, you think of them as the bastion of democracy, and yet the last two elections were basically rigged, for lack of a better word. Um, mysteriously bad things were happened and were reported about and, you know, whatnot to basically all of the major contenders of Rodin. So magically, he won. Um, we'll see what happens if we, if we ever get another Galente election. Yeah, well, you talked about the fact that the Galante Federation actually gets caught in doing some of these things. So is there like some sort of Galante Federation version of Snowden that we should be aware of or any like major incidents? Well, uh, it, I don't know if it's necessarily any major incidents, but you got to just think like, like characters in a story each have their thing, right? Um, and the, th the thing for the Federation is that they have a bunch of spies everywhere, right? So... So when the Kainoke plague was becoming a thing, um, the Glente's part in it was that like the FIO was possibly covering up what happened or how it all came about, right? Like they're always the FIO is always kind of around, um, and there's always accusations that they're spying or you know Caldari will catch some FIO folk or an operation going on in in their space. Like if you pay attention, you'll just it, it crops up all the time in the news. Uh, the Galente are just this spy network organization, basically, uh, within the universe. Um, but I also, just to kind of share a cool thing about the Galente in general, um, there's the skin, right? There's the Caldari, uh, not the Caldari, uh, the, the, the Kali skin, right? Glittering dreams of Kali. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the glistening streets of Kali is actually a really interesting place. Kali is, uh, one of the biggest, it's, uh, cities in Galente Prime. And, uh, there is a really cool chronicle about these, this glistening, uh, city or listening street. But so their big, like strip, like if you think they're like Las Vegas strip, you know, their popular spot is this, uh, crystalline s s street where every building on this road is made out of crystal or diamond or something like that, clear, shiny, crystalline. Some of it's synthetic, some of it's grown, some of it's moved in, you know, whatever, but every building on this street has to be built out of this sh you know, shiny crystal. And that's what gave it, gives it its name. It's this amazing tourist attraction. Um, and below it are these giant slabs of basically synthetic diamond. And below that is a giant slab of reinforced like titanium plating. And then underneath that is the location of much of the Galente government structures and um, institutions that remain safe basically because uh, they, they know that in order to destroy them, first of all, it would require quite a bit of a bunker buster to go through all of that defenses, but that it would be impossible to actually attack the Galente government structures without destroying the entire city first. And so uh, the Federation uh, have this wonderful, beautiful place where people can do all this crazy stuff and there's all this indulgence and it's really just a giant meat shield for the government. And that, in my opinion, pretty much sums up the Galente in a very perfect little pocket. <laughs> wow. So. What, what is it just like, uh, something that I've always tried to do is actually to move away from just talking about how we as capture leaders interact with these empires. What would it be like to just be the a regular human, like a regular normal person who happens to live in the Galante Federation? What are the differences that someone might immediately notice if they were to be transported into New Eden? Yeah, um, man, this is... Like, I know a lot of people want 
every video game about Eve to be directly connected to New Eden, like actually the Eve client and interact with each other like Dust did. But man, what I love, like I want a pulp noir detective game set in Kali. You know what I mean? Like I want, <laughs> I want a real time strategy like city management builder on on uh, Arcturus or, or uh, New Caldari Prime. Um, and because you're right, like we don't actually know that much about the life of a baseliner, even though um, there are millions of them. There's far more of them than there are of of us. Um, and uh, we don't actually get very many of their stories, except for the horror stories that we get out of the Chronicles. Um, <clears throat> uh, Kali is very much your pr very typical um, cyberpunk, neon signs, almost uh, Blade Runner-esque kind of environment. Um, Whereas, by contrast, Arcturios, which is the second largest city on Caldari Prime, is uh, also very dystopian or like cyberpunkish, but like it's cold because Arcturios is like this frozen, or sorry, Caldari Prime is way colder, or New Caldari Prime is way colder than than uh, the other planets, and so they actually have this net above it that is heated that freezes or that like breaks up the snow that's coming down. So there's always like this trickling uh, dreariness. Um, in Arcturios, Arcturios. So yeah, in both of these cities, you have this very um, pseudo dystopian cyberpunk future kind of setting. But yeah, we don't actually have that much information. There's there's um, there's the Chronicles of the Glistening, Glistening Streets um, and some other stuff. But we definitely know a little bit more about like day to day life in places like the Amar, maybe even the Mimitar than the Galente, beyond just the fact that there is a lot of liberty. So if you just take all of those kind of dystopian novels that you ever read, like 1984 and Strange New World and you know all that kind of stuff, and you lump it all together, uh, you kind of start to see what the Federation would be like. So uh, lots of entertainment, lots of easy access to drugs and distractions, uh, um, but also, a lot of surveillance, a lot of control, a lot of uh, false freedom. They do have cat girls, though. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, they they really believe in like biological engineering, and people can be whoever they want to be, and all that sort of stuff. So if it can be done with surgery, they probably they probably do it. Yeah, that's something that um, Hilmar actually touched on recently. Not to get a get slightly away from the topic, but the idea of not having a binary character generator in Eve, which I thought was a very interesting concept. It is an interesting concept. Um, uh, not to get too far into headcanon, but like Ashrathi and really the Catslayer population as a whole, I think, um, like the idea of gender is a very mortal um, opinion, right? Like you, you have gender in essence, so that way you can procreate. Um, we as transhuman, like, what good is gender to us? Why, what does it mean besides some sort of um, tether to our old life? So yeah, it makes total sense. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that they had, a little early on, we were talking about the uh, first Caldari Galante War, and you talked about how them coming into contact with the Amar later was important to how that played out. And then you went on to say that they now had bigger fish to fry. So what is the relationship between the Galante and the Amar Empire? Because those are the two largest groups. Yeah, um, definitely strained. Like I said, um, the, well, the Galente are very much about freedom and uh, anti-slavery. So when they encounter the Amar and the Mimitar, they are pretty much immediately put on uh, the side of the Mimitar, as it were. And so, in fact, the Mimitar, from my understanding, if I remember correctly, so the Amar use this drug to control the Mimitar known as Vitoc. And Vitoc is this addictive substance that basically has a withdrawal symptom of death. So uh, they forcibly inject this drug into the Mimitar people 
such that now they become become dependent on their Amarian lords for continual um, upkeep of this of this drug. And so this is one of their major systems of control against the Mimitar. And what the Glente did was help develop basically a synthetic Vitok to help um, some of the Mimitar who are breaking free uh, not be reliant on their uh, Amarian masters. And so, yeah, no, the, the Glente and the Amar have, are not friends. Uh, they haven't been in open conflict since the Uli Convention and, you know, whatnot. But um, the Amar have really strong business ties with the Kaldari, in particular Khanid and Tash Murkon, both um, Khanid when he left the Amarian Empire, became very close with the Kaldari state for support, which is why Khanid vehicles use missiles instead of lasers. And Katis Tashmurkan, the current empress of Amar, actually gave up her wealth and moved to the state area and basically became, independently became the, the wealthiest woman in the cluster before returning home to Amar to become, or to be her, the heir of the Tashmurkan family. So, uh, now that she is the empress, um, any chances of there being a rift or division between the state and the Amar have uh, grown very, you know, dim. That being said, um, the Federation and the Mimitar still have some pretty decent relationships. The uh, the Amar, or sorry, the, Mimitar, uh, the Glente still have a very oppressive our way is the best way. And so they kind of try to control the Mimitar and how they develop. Um, once again, uh, think of like the way that America does things in like some uh, like Middle East countries or whatever. Where it's like, yeah, you can do whatever you want to do as long as you use this model. You know what I mean? Like you can do whatever you want to do as long as you do it our way. Um, and the Mimitar have gotten around it by kind of playing lip service to it. So they are still pretty friendly. But, um, you know, among the leadership, there is some tension between the San Matar, the leadership of the Matar and uh, uh, Mimitar and uh, Rodin, just because Rodin is so power hungry, I guess, is a good way to think of it. From what I understand, there's also a lot of migration between the Mimitar Republic and the Galante Federation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the Mimitar people are, are nomadic and tribal in nature in the first place. So the idea of them all staying in their ancestral home ground, especially after everything that happened, was pretty um, not attractive to a lot of the Mimitar. And so now 35% uh, of the Galente Federation is actually made up of Mimitari nationals. Things that I think is a little interesting about how the quote-unquote democracy of the Galante Federation works that we haven't touched on so far is the fact that there are, they actually use a multitude of different systems within each of the states that makes up the federation that's true yeah each each member state kind of has their own internal leadership but then there is the centralized kind of senatorial body that runs a, it runs the 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 federational business if that makes sense kind of like the difference between states and federal government in uh the usa a very USA style <laughs> style group, yeah. But I thought it was interesting purely because they have a very they have a they seem to use a lot of stuff like direct and hybrid democracies, which are different to how we as people who are used to the modern uh, liberal democracy model would understand a democracy to work. Because you don't vote for someone to go and represent you you vote on everything that could potentially happen in the first place. You vote on every bill as an individual that's a part of that state in the majority of Galante Federation states. Well, you clearly know uh, more about the political machinations of some of the member states than I do at this point. <laughs> um, but I, I, yeah, I, I mean, all I really know is that um, the, the states, uh, often the member states, especially people like the Yinmei, do not necessarily share, or and and the Intaki do not necessarily share the, um, the full belief of uh, the Federation. So the Inmei is a is a caste, has a very strict caste system, 
um, that they maintain in spite of their democratic nature. Um, and then the Antaki are, like I said, very religious. They have a, they have like imam type characters, uh, these religious leaders that that end up helping them out. That that uh, they believe reincarnate over and over again. In the Antaki, um, most of the candidates are reborn, from what I know. So they are the people who, basically, are. Oh, are we going to explain the Antaki, or are we going to save that for its own thing? I think it's probably a good <laughs> thing to to save for its own thing. But basically, they believe that you can transfer the consciousness of people who are dying into people who are being born basically it is effectively my understanding of it yeah um it, it is reborn but it's not like capsuleer reborn this is more like um dalai lama reborn yeah, reincarnation fact, almost <clears throat> yeah yeah in fact um recently uh actually kicking off the whole amarian plot line that started last october um it all started when the Intaki discovered what they believe to be one of their reincarnated leaders as a slave on Con on one of the Conid or in one of the Conid facilities, and so demanded uh, them return their religious leader. And of course, Conid said no. And then uh, the fireballing started. Uh, so I, I also looked up a little bit more <clears throat> about the day to day life of the Galente, which is that so uh, a lot of the things are taken care of from uh by for a galente by the by the system but uh the galente federation is very very much a nation of haves and have nots right if you are part of the wealthy upper class then you're great and you've got perfect freedoms and all that kind of stuff and if you're not then you are basically uh struggling to get by in a very real way uh hence that you know cyberpunk dystopian you know there's the there's the wealthy people in the really nice shiny buildings, and then there's the guys in the in the alleys, you know, drugged up or whatever. Um, Note, listener, this is a theme that we will be coming back to several times over the course of this series. Yeah, yeah, um, but they have like public, uh, free public schooling. Uh, I think they've got like healthcare and all those sort of socialized services. Um, and, but their schooling is very much about kind of like identifying what uh, skills a person has and how to maximize it and where and where to put them um, within the larger strata of society. Um, they are fully they're they're very social people. They're like encouraged to be uh, to be uh, to intermingle uh, with both internally and with other nations, um, diplomatic. But again, like a lot of this is because they want to be everywhere. They want to have eyes and ears. Um, uh, and, and then once they finish schooling, they're basically expected to be a full-fledged adult, member of the society, et cetera. So yeah, very similar to our world. But again, uh, very much like, like as if it was a fever dream. All of the conspiracy theories that you've ever, or that you hear about like American government or even like British government, uh, like, imagine if all of those were, like, 100% true, and you pretty much have uh, the Galente. So are there, any, uh, are there any parts of the Galente Federation that you think uh, are nicer or good or, you know, might be interesting to talk about from that perspective? Uh, interesting and good. Uh, I mean, there are, while, the, you know, obviously the top government, the, the spying and all that sort of stuff is important, there is definitely... A lot of people within the federation that does believe in freedom and does believe in, you know, equality and all these kinds of things. And so, you know, um, there's a reason why the Sisters of Eve is partially Galente, you know, Galente Amarian uh, group. Um, uh, I don't know about good things, but actually, I do know there's two other stories kind of about the Galente that I can think of. One is, um, you know, they they are all about automation. Right, like they don't have as big of a population as the Mimitar, or as the Amar, and they don't have the slave force as the of the Mimitar. So they believe in basically automating everything because they believe in the um, in the value of the individual. So it's like let's not let's not make too many people be on one ship or whatever. Let's not let's take the menial tasks and give them over to uh, automation. Cool. 
Well, they pushed it too far one time and did an expedition out into Nolsec um, with a ship that was like one step too far. It was it was basically a fully automated, um, capable of self repair, capable of making certain basic decisions mining fleet that was sent out into deep null sec. And we're not 100% what happened, uh, sure what happened, but basically that uh, became what we now know as the rogue drones. So that's actually why the rogue drones look like uh, Dominix's, not because they took over Dominix's, but because that's basically the template by which they modeled themselves off of, because that's what they originally were. Um, and so that's the first thing, which is the Federation is totally responsible for the rogue drone problem. Um, and then the other interesting story is, um, so the, the, the capital of, uh, the Galente Federation has moved from Galente Prime after all of that shenanigans, uh, to, um, Valor. And when they were doing their expansion outward, there was this solar system that was not too far away. Um, so they sent out this crew um, in suspended animation to go to this other solar system to build a stargate to connect this new system to Valor. Uh, this is something that they've done many times uh, in order to expand into other solar systems. Um, but when this crew got there, uh, the one guy who survived wakes up and discovers that all of the rest of the crew has perished uh, during the journey. And so it's just him and his robots. And over time, he continues to kind of work on the bots, and he makes cooler ones, and he, and he gets them to do everything he needs them to do. And slowly but surely, he begins to work on the project that he was there to do. Um, and then finally, after a very long time, when he, by the time he is a very old man, he finally finishes the Stargate, activates it, and goes home. Uh, much to the surprise of all of the people in the Galente who had basically written off this, this expedition as a failure, you know, decades ago. And here comes this old dude that they barely recognized, and now he's created a connection to a new system. And that system was named in his honor and is now known as Old Man Star. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. If you guys have any questions about the Galante Federation, don't be afraid to leave them in the comments. I'm sure we'll be able to do a viewers' questions episode at some point, Asheroth. That'll be fun. Sure thing. That sounds great. I'm sure there's some stuff I missed. But yeah, thank you for coming along and sharing your expertise on the lore. I really appreciate it, Asheroth. Where can people find you if they want to watch some more of your content? Sure thing. Uh, I stream every weekday. Uh, I do invasion fleets, talk about the lore, do whatever else is interesting, hunt down Rasnaborgs, uh, whatever comes up. Um, that, so it'd be twitch.tv or slash Astrothi. Um, I've got my YouTube channel, which isn't a pretty link, um, so I'll give it to you. Um, and uh, obviously, I actually recommend just following me on Twitter, um, at Astrothi because that's where I normally post like any news I get. Um, if people report to me stuff about um, the going ons of various NPC activities, uh, that's usually where I post it. If we see anything new on Hobolites or anything new, anything gets announced, I usually post about it there. So it's a really good way. I try to keep it to be a, a, a good way to stay up to date with what's going on, both with my operations and just even even online in general. All right, well, until next time, guys, fly smart and take care of yourselves. A special thanks, as always, goes out to our Crassus, Pinche Infidel from Old School, as well as to our other $5 patrons in Dustin Prater, Meeks, Zar, Olav Aldent, and Big Bad of Boom, as well as to everyone else who helps support the channel either just by watching or by donating a smaller amount to the Patreon. Thank you for listening, and have a wonderful day.